It was more than 20 years ago. Suddenly everything went dark. I was on my way to the beach. It was a public holiday in Mozambique where I was living in exile. And I knew that something terrible was happening to me. I didn't know what, what it was. If I was dead, I didn't know. If I was alive, I didn't know. And suddenly into the darkness, I hear a voice saying, Albi, this is Ivo Corrido. You're in the Maputo Central Hospital. Your arm is in a lamentable condition. You have to face the future with courage. And I said into the darkness, what happened? And a voice, a woman's voice answered, it was a car bomb. And I knew that the South African security had tried to kill me. That moment that every freedom fighter is waiting for. Will I get through the night? Will I get through the day? Will I be brave? They'd come for me. They tried to kill me. And I'd survived. I felt joyous. And that feeling of elation has stayed with me since 1988 until today. I was eventually moved to hospital in London and I was so happy that I'd only lost an arm, that I was cheerful almost all the time, but at night, early in the morning, four o'clock, the painkillers were wearing off, I'm all alone. I'd feel very isolated and I would sing to myself uh, a song, uh, used to call it a Negro spiritual, by the great African-American freedom fighter, Paul Robeson. It's me, it's me, O oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. It's me, it's me, O oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. It's not my brother nor my sister, but it's me, O oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. And I felt very alone, and I would go through my uncle, my auntie, and my cousins. And then I'd fall asleep again, and I'd wake up, and the nurses would come with tea and I would cheer up and I'd be cheerful during the day. One day, the nurses bring me a letter. I open it and I read it. It says, Dear Comrade Alby, don't worry, we will avenge you. Signed, Bobby Naidu. And I'm thinking, what does Bobby mean? We are going to cut off the arms of the people who did this. We are going to blind in one eye the people who did this. What sort of country will that be that we inherited? We inherit after all the struggle. People without arms, without sight in their eyes. And I said to myself, if we get democracy, if we get freedom, if we get the rule of law, that will be my soft vengeance. And afterwards I heard that one of the alleged bombers had been caught in Mozambique and was being locked up and was going to be put on trial. And I said, if the evidence is insufficient and if he is found not guilty, that will be my soft vengeance. Because then we're living under the rule of law. And that's more important than sending one rascal to jail. And I remember saying to myself, lying in the hospital bed, roses and lilies will grow out of my arm. And so that theme of soft vengeance, in a sense, has become the theme of my life since then. And to the extent that we have a constitution, we have a constitutional court, a beautiful building, constructed right in the heart of the prison where Gandhi and Mandela were locked up, we South Africans say with a dubious pride, we have the only jail in the world where both Gandhi and Mandela were locked up. 
That's where we built our constitutional court that upholds the values of our new constitution. And that to me is the soft vengeance. It's a phrase that I use myself. A film is being made about my life and that will be the title of that film. So that's the first part of my presentation today. The second part, I'm now Judge Albie Sachs, member of the Constitutional Court, sitting in my office. The phone rings and the voice says, it's reception here, there's a man called Henry who says he has an appointment to see you. And I say send him through. And I go to the security gate and my heart's going boom, 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 because Henry had phoned me to say that he was the person who had organized the placing of the bomb in my car. He's now going to South Africa's Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Am I willing to meet him? And I said, yes. And I opened the door and there I see somebody tall and thin like me, younger than myself, and he's looking at me and I see in his eyes, so this is the man I tried to kill. And he sees in my eyes, so this is the man who tried to kill me. We'd never met before. We had argued or quarreled over money, position, love, passion. But he was on that side and I was on this side and he tried to kill me. We walked to my office, which we call my chambers, and I remember he was striding like a soldier and I tried to slow him down with my best judge's slow walk. And we talk. We talk, we talk, we talk, we talk, we talk. And eventually I stand up and I say, Henry, normally when I say goodbye to somebody, I shake that person's hand. I can't shake your hand. But go to the Truth Commission, tell them what you know, maybe we'll meet one day. And I remember that as we returned to the security gate, this time he's not striding like a soldier. He's shuffling along and he goes out and I forget Henry. Now what was this truth commission that he was going to go to? I think it's important for people to understand its actual origins. We didn't set up a truth commission in South Africa simply in order to deal with the crimes committed against the people by apartheid. The very first time the issue cropped up, in fact, in direct form, was at a meeting of the ANC, the National Executive Committee, before we had our first democratic elections. I was on the NEC. And the issue there was what to do about a report that came to the conclusion, a body set up by the ANC, that the ANC had used torture against captives in our custody during the liberation struggle. And the report said we should take action against the people who, prima facie, were responsible. We had a very, very fierce debate. It's one of those issues you can't decide on a vote of, on a vote, a show of hands. It's a deep moral question. And some people said, we asked for the report, we've got the report, we must follow through. And others said, you've got to understand the circumstances, the young people, none of them had been trained in police methods. They'd just come out of school, they'd left university to fight for freedom. They did to the enemy what the enemy was doing to us. They thought that's the way you treat captives. And then someone said, what would my mother say? That's his mother. His mother was a figure often used in our political debates of somebody who's not politi politically very knowledgeable, maybe two or three years schooling, but a strong sense of right and wrong. And he said, my mother would say, there's something strange about the ANC. You are correctly looking at your own failures, but what about what the regime has been doing to us for decades and centuries? And we're not looking at that at all. Where's the balance? And that was when my friend, Professor Kata Asmal, sadly now the late Professor Kata Asmal, stood up and said, what we need is a truth commission in South Africa that will look at all the violations from all the sides. So ironically in South Africa, the truth commission was established on the initiative of the ANC because the ANC itself had violated its own norms 
during the liberation struggle.